Indy 500 Films presents The Legends of the Brickyard. It sounds like a cliché, but indeed it is a rare breed of man who not only comes to Indianapolis and captures the Brickyard, but does so more than once. Hi everyone, I'm Larry Newberg. And I'm Bob Jenkins. Throughout the month, we'll take you back to some of the more recent months of May to relive some of the more memorable Indianapolis 500 classics. Take, for instance, 1976, when the number two seemed to be quite prominent, while the country was celebrating its 200th birthday. A man from Fort Worth, Texas, captured his second Indianapolis 500 driving car number two. So sit back, relax, and enjoy with us the 1976 Indianapolis 500. Job well done's a race well won, my friend. In Indiana there is a place where history's made by a big car race. At 500 miles the flags put down, three miles a miniature leaving the ground. It's gentlemen, start your engines, please. Balloons fly high in the springtime breeze. A good year in the sky above. The fans are there for the race they love. Rolling, wheels keep rolling. It's race day and it's time to be alone. Home. Just to be in the race is a lifelong goal. Hope to share in the big payroll. Men and machine will point the way to solve the riddle of the month of May. I'm rolling home. The day is May 8, 1976. It is the first day of 17 allotted for building speed and qualifying for a starting place in the May 30th Indianapolis 500. Pressure is on, for time is short in which to prove new machines and for newcomers to learn the peculiarities of this 68-year-old monument to auto racing. A split-second error, airborne attack. Watch it again in slow motion. The man with the sore neck is Eddie Miller of Lakewood, Colorado. He says, I'll be back next year. How many times has that phrase, I'll be back next year, been spoken? It is an echo repeated many times since that first 500 in 1911. Right over there is where they built the new Indianapolis Hall of Fame, dedicated to man, machine, and that unconquered will to keep trying, which is a part of every successful driver. Tony Holman, Speedway President and Carl Kaiser Curator, visit the new Hall of Fame with veteran auto racing commentator Bud Lindemann. Here are yesterday's dreams of the future. They are as bright and shiny as they were on the day they were built. There are cars from every speed era and a place for today's creations when they too join the past parade of progress. There are many beautiful trophies in the Indianapolis Hall of Fame, won by men who established the traditions of the 500. But traditions were made to be broken. What's that you say? A woman going to drive in the 500? Yes, there she is, Janet Guthrie, part of the 1976 Indianapolis crop of rookie drivers. Her debut, considerably reported in the press, 
was somewhat overshadowed by a host of mechanical problems, which would have dampened the spirits of anyone less determined. Every time she set out to run the two-phase driver's test, something broke. It was as though a power higher than her frustrated chief mechanic, Rolla Balstead, was taking a deterring hand. But finally, she passed the 165 mile per hour phase of her test and removed the rookie stripes from her car. She actually ran in the low 70s which is more than 20 miles per hour faster than Parnelli Jones's 1962 full speed. But today it takes at least 181 to make the race. Janet still has a long way to go. It was a day just like this in 1973 when Johnny Rutherford came within a heart-stopping split second of the 200 mile per hour barrier. And the next year he won the 500. Last year he was second. And now, well, how about the pole spot and another win? 188,957 would seem to be a good start, but there will probably be a discussion with Mr. Foyt about all this. His car isn't handling well. He drifts out to the wall. 185,261, that won't do it. Maybe if we just turn around, he won't see us when he comes in. Boyd is two-time 500 winner Al Unser at 186.258. Johnny Parsons at 182. And the second race for Bill Pewterball. The winner's ring. Bobby Unser, like his brother, has two of them. A first race for Vern Schupen from South Australia. Three Grant King team cars. 96, driven by Bob Harkey. 97, Sheldon Kinzer. And 98, with John Martin as the wheel. John Martin wins his place in the Bicentennial 500. Behind him are the magicians of Gasoline Alley. They work their magic during the month of May. And then they are gone, and Gasoline Alley is peopled by memories. But behind closed doors, the next 500 has its beginning. The months take away. Master mechanic Herb Porter builds racing engines. His contemporary, George Bignotti, builds a new chassis. Racing tires are built and held in readiness. Then when the snow is gone, you test the whole new package. This is Mark. And this is May 15th. There's only two weeks to go. Spike Gelhausen in 19 and Billy Scott in number 28 will both make the race. So will Al Loquasta. In the second qualifying weekend, Mario Andretti, the 1969 winner, is back from Europe. He makes the field with 189-404. Then Janet Guthrie makes a decision. The speed she needs to qualify is still missing amidst all the mechanical problems. Point's backup car, shook down but not qualified, is loaned to her for practice. The speed climbs. She makes her point, but time runs out. Janet will not start the 500. and the 500. Mike Hiss of Tustin, California, fights the clock and loses. 5.59 p.m., May 23rd. 
the last chance for anyone to make the show. Jan Opperman bumps Eldon Rasmussen and moves into the field. Just maybe in about 20 years, she'll be qualifying with her daddy watching. This is the fence that Eddie Miller, one of the first of the Super V grads, knocked down when he was involved in that hair-raising flip coming out of turn number one. He landed right there. Well, he walked away from that accident, and despite his promise that I'll be back, he never again stepped into a race car. The cars are ready. And the people are here, 300,000 of them, perhaps more. But in Gasoline Alley, the mechanics are unimpressed. Their world is here, and the deadline to finish is just two hours away. a 1925 Duesenberg. Bob Hope rides with Tony Homer. It's more than a race. It's people and color and excitement. It's the 500. Wait. 
moved up to challenge Rutherford, who has fled from the pole. Coming down the main straightaway, he passes. It is the start of the fourth lap. Andretti moves from 19th to 7th. It's Roger McCluskey, turn three. He's okay, but his Hopkins special is a little bent. The caution flag is out for the 10th lap accident. A little early, perhaps, for routine pit stops, but Al Unser is followed by his brother, Bobby. Boyd comes in, just as the green flag goes up. With five men over the wall during a pit stop, a sixth must operate a special long wrench to adjust the horizontal control wing at the rear of the car. When Boyd left the pits, the wrench went with him. Officials were going to black flag him, but the wrench dropped off. Still, the yellow light was on for three more laps. Roger McCluskey, national driving champion in 1973, retired as a driver in 1979. Today, he is USAC's director of competition. But McCluskey went out on top, winning the 1979 Milwaukee 200 in his final IndyCar race. The lead goes to Pancho Carter for three laps. Then to Wally Dallenbach. He's passed by teammate Gordon Johncott. Sneva leads the 38th lap. Then Rutherford leads. In the 60th lap, Rutherford makes his third pit stop. Wheel gone, Johnny Parsons carefully maneuvers his car into the pits. The yellow is on and Foyt comes in. Because Rutherford is slowed by the yellow light, Foyt is able to complete his fuel stop and take over the lead. Almost a collision in the pits. Mike Mosley is going out, Mario Andretti coming in. Boyd has nine seconds on Rutherford in the 70th lap. John Martin comes in. His teammates are on the track. All three of Grant King's cars are still running. Wind. And there's a storm on the road. This is where Johnny Rutherford won the race. He knew the rain was coming and went. His crew kept talking to the Weather Bureau. And so he made an all-out bid to catch Foyt and secure the lead. He continued to widen the gap while anxiously watching the sky. Wheels keep rolling. Or was that a prayer? Toward the 100 lap mark, there is more than 12 seconds separating first and second. Jerry Grant posts slowly in turn three. Half the race gone. Boyd is still second. Then, raindrops and a yellow flag. The fans cover up with plastic, but where does a race driver go to get out of the rain? The red flag is put out by Pat Vidan in the 103rd lap. afternoon moves 
drives on. The rain stops and the track dries slowly. Within two hours, the track is dry enough that they prepare for a restart. But at the last moment, the rain comes down again. Johnny Russell becomes the first man in history to walk into winner's circle. Well, not only did John Martin finish, but all three Grant King cars were running at the end of this half Indy 500. Sheldon Kinzer was 19th, Bob Harkey 20th, and Martin was 21st. When a man in team work for a dream Rolling Wheels keep rolling A job well done's a race well won, my friend Indiana, there is a place History was made by the big car race 500 miles, a flag goes down. Three miles a minute flying on the ground. Excitement's gone, the tires have won. Fighting miles in a race will run. A good year sails the sky above. The fans have shared in the race they love. Rolling, wheels keep rolling. all alone Rolling Wheels keep rolling A race is gone and one more on the road Just to be in the race is a lifelong goal Hope to share in the big payroll Men and machine have pointed the way We've solved the riddle of the month of May. So for the second straight year, rain forced an early end to the Indianapolis 500. In 75, the race was just 26 laps from completion. But 76 will be the shortest Indy 500 in history, going just two laps past the halfway point. And Lone Star J.R., who was runner-up the year before, literally walked away with his second 500 title in three years. And Bob, while of course it takes skill to win this race and a little bit of luck, you must first hope to finish this race. Amazingly, in 1976, a record 27 of the 33 starters took the checkered flag. And the top two finishers, J.R. and A.J., gave Texans reasons to celebrate, while thousands of miles away Australians celebrated Vern Chupan, that year's Rookie of the Year. I'm Larry Newbert. And I'm Bob Jenkins. And with that, we finish the final chapter of the 1976 Indianapolis 500. Next time, we'll take you back to one of the most memorable races, 1977, as we continue to recount the legends of the Brickyard.